Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Cola Prez. We're thrilled to have you guys here this morning. Come on in and grab a seat. It's a special welcome to everybody in the building, everybody who's worshiping from home, joining us that way. So good to be with God's family together as we worship. I want to remind you guys that we just completed a new members class, and so if you were part of that class, um, we are going to present those new members on November 22nd. So either service that you're in, we'll present you there. Uh, if you have any questions about kind of where you stand in the membership process, please let me know and we'll see if you need to be interviewed or what needs to happen. But that's going to happen on November 22nd. We will have our regular monthly church-wide prayer meeting this Wednesday at 1.30 p.m. What a great time to gather in prayer immediately after the election, cast ourselves on God's care and what he is doing in our nation. And so that will happen this Wednesday, 1.30 in this space. Uh, this morning, we just began child care starting all the way from six months to four years old. That happens in the nine o'clock service. The reason we're doing it there is to kind of continue to spread out um, those who attend on Sunday morning. So by having it at the nine o'clock, people are able to attend that service as well. So if that suits your family better, please know that that is available to you. Uh, that's my announcements. Now I'm going to introduce you Jenny Walsh, who uh, is a physician in this church who participates with Medical Campus Outreach, and we're going to hear about that ministry. Good morning. <laughs> Good to see you. Uh, Medical Campus Outreach is um, started, it started about 28 years ago. Some people uh, that were in medicine that had come out of Campus Outreach training themselves um, began medical campus outreach when several of their co-classmates became believers um, through their sharing of the gospel, and they wanted to have a ministry to people in medicine specifically. Um, so it's distinct in that it simply ministers to people in the medical profession. Here in Columbia, we have medical students, but we also have a lot of allied health students and other health professionals um, joining us, like nursing students, um, occupational health, uh, speech pathology. We have um, physical therapy students as well, um, and uh, just a, a whole range. So everyone who is in the healthcare profession that is here, a part of this church, would, we would love to have you join us, whether it be to mentor students and to be a part of it that way, or to join us for the Bible study. We meet on Tuesdays. Um, we've begun meeting again for about a month and a half. We meet outdoors um, right now with a um, boxed meal for dinner on Tuesday evenings, and we do a Bible study um, and hoping to get to the point eventually where we can meet indoors again. <laughs> but we have fire pits, so you can stay warm, <laughs> and everyone's welcome. But we would also like to share a little bit about the ministry that you guys, this church, has supported so faithfully. We thank you very much for that. Neil Burkhalter. Um, is an elder here at the church, and he's the one who began the branch that we have here in Columbia. Um, but we, we are looking also for um, people that can enter into this ministry in any way you would like to support it, um, praying for us especially as it's been more difficult this year to reach out to the first-year students as they're a bit more isolated with COVID. So we appreciate all of that. Um, we take a trip in the spring in um, May, it didn't happen this year, but we're hoping next May to Peru every year, bringing students there to share the gospel there, as well as learning how to do that faithfully with medicine. So capturing students is a really big thing. As you guys all know, this church is all about um, student ministries because you catch them on the front end before they enter into their profession, um, and you're able to teach them the principles of how to integrate your faith how to share the gospel in the midst of what you're doing. Um, hospital, the root of the word hospital, is actually providing care for a foreigner or a stranger, um, an open place for that. And so um, medicine is something that missionaries have used in a variety of countries, and Christians are known. I have a good friend, actually, in Indonesia who told me, Christians are known here for health care <laughs> in some ways, in certain portions of the because we would come in and, and open up a hospital a lot of times as a way to minister, um, to show the love of the gospel there. So anyway, I, I am now going to um, introduce Luke Fain, who is, and, and his wife, um, as they come up to share with you about their ministry. Um, and thank you, thank you for the support of this church. 
Thank you. Yes, we are Luke and Kim Fain. This is our son, Ember, sleepy old Ember. Um, anyway, we are members here at CPC, and we serve with pioneers in Southeast Asia. So we are here to say a short update and a big thank you for all of the support that this church has had in our lives and in the work that is going on in Southeast Asia. It is a huge blessing to us both financially and in prayer and also in encouragement. We greatly appreciate all of the notes, emails, phone calls, FaceTimes that we have received, especially during our time in Southeast Asia. Anyway, uh, we spent a year and two months learning language and culture, and we attended a language school. And during that time, we were able to progress in our language learning to a point where if you kind of look at it as like, don't know anything to native speaker, we got to right in the middle. So we, it was very hard. We spent a lot, a lot, a lot of time in class and in tutoring and in the community trying to learn language. Um, and it was a very tough year. Uh, we made a lot of mistakes. I made huge, humiliating mistakes in language that we won't get into, but um, <clears throat> it was tough. And there were a lot of times that we thought, you know, Lord, what are we doing here? Are we ever going to get this? Are we ever going to be effective or make a difference? Um, and it was discouraging at times. But I wanted to share with you all how encouraging the Lord was to us and how he was faithful to give us opportunities to be with Indonesians. These are some of our closest friends that we made, Paka Goose and Ibu Herni, uh, and two of their children. They have another son named Aldo. Um, when we went to Indonesia, we, when we went to Southeast Asia, we prayed. <laughs> we prayed that the Lord would give us natives who would help us in our language. And we, we envisioned that might be a pastor or another Christian who kind of got what we were doing and would want to help us in, in learning. Well, he actually gave us Muslims. And he used Muslims to help us learn a lot about the culture and language. So we would go over and we would drink tea and we would eat hot snacks and fruits and, and they were so generous to us. Well, one day the Lord gave us an opportunity with them and Ibu Herni looked at me and she said, Luke, do you ever get angry at Kim? And Kim was sitting right there, so I thought it was kind of a trap. I was like, uh, no, I don't, she's perfect. Um, but they were like, do you ever get angry? And, and right then Kim's kind of looking at me with the eyes of like, you know, wink, wink, take your opportunity to share the gospel. You know, the Lord's soft pitching it to you. And I just totally missed it. And we got on our motor scooter to go back home. And she's like, why didn't you tell them about how the Lord changed your life and took care of your anger and worked in you? And I was like, I don't know. I'm a, I'm a terrible person. I just don't know. Well, that was discouraging. But then a week later, the Lord gave us yet another opportunity with them. And they were like, Luke, you know, do you ever get angry? Luke, do you ever hit Kim? And I immediately was like, oh boy, this is, this is intense. This is going somewhere. And they told us about how Paka Goose had one time hit Ibu Herni and they had struggled with their marriage. And, and the Lord was just so faithful to give us the opportunity to be a light. And, and I got it right the second time. You know, I was able to point them to Jesus the second time. But it was a beautiful time that we got to be there and the Lord was so faithful in the midst of all the hardships that we faced in language and in culture. He gave us the opportunity to share about him and to be light there. So we were incredibly thankful for that. So as of right now, we plan on going back to Southeast Asia uh, this upcoming January. That's contingent on if we get our visa, which is like our government permissions to go back in. Uh, please pray with us that our visa will be granted. Once we get there, I will be stepping into a teaching role at a small Bible school. And the hope is that Kim and Ember and myself, we're actually on a team doing outreach to Muslims. So please pray for us. Please pray for us during that transition. Pray that the work in Southeast Asia would be accomplished and that God would be glorified. We are currently in need of some financial support. We took a huge loss when we first got to the mission field. The Lord has been incredibly faithful. And if you all would like to hear more, here's our contact information. Also, there are a lot of new faces here, a lot of people that we have not met. 
we would love to get to know you. We would love to meet you. We would love to share a meal with you and, and be the church and have a relationship. So here's our email address. Here's our phone numbers. Copy them down. Take a picture, whatever you want to do, or don't. Um, but if you would like to be on our bi-monthly newsletter emails, please send us an email. You can unsubscribe at any time. There's no pressure. But... Um, but please, we would love to get to know you. We would love to share and walk this partnership out with you and do it all to the glory of God. Thank you for having us. Luke and Kim, thank you guys so much. Stay up here for a second. You can hang on to that. Um, I cannot commend these folks to you more. We adore Luke and Kim. They've been such a precious part of our church when they were here. The Lord has been so faithful using them as they've been away when we commissioned them a year ago. It's just amazing to see what God is doing. I commend us as a church to find our place. We give, we tithe to this church body to be able to do mission work. But then each of us is wondering, what do we do above and beyond that? And this is a tremendous couple. We put their picture on our fridge. We teach our kids what it means to be called to the ends of the earth to share the gospel with people who have never heard a clear explanation of the gospel before. And they can visualize it because they know this family because they're in our church. And that's a tremendous way to show our kids the great commission of the gospel. So thank you guys for your ministry. Would you stand as God calls us to worship? I'm going to keep you guys up here to pray for you. But Psalm 47, our call to worship, is true for us. It is true for the fanes. It's true in the West. It's true in the East. It's true the Sunday before the election. It's true the Sunday after the election. This stuff doesn't get messed with. This is eternal stuff that we speak of. This is why we're here to worship. Listen to this. God has gone up with a shout, the Lord with the sound of a trumpet. Sing praises to God, sing praises, sing praises to our King, sing praises. For God is the King of all the earth, sing praises with a song. Let's pray together. Lord, you are King, Master, Ruler, Sovereign over all the earth. You're Sovereign of this church and this city. You're Sovereign of this nation and the election this week. You are sovereign over Luke and Kim and to where you have called them in Southeast Asia. You're sovereign over to the island on which they'll land when they return and the work that you have for them. You're sovereign over medical campus outreach. You're sovereign over campus outreach and RUF and Young Life and Young Lives in Capernaum. You hold these ministries in your hand and you will do your good and faithful work. Let us praise you as king today, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.
Good morning, Cola Prez. Please have a seat. My name is Trevor Allen. I'm the Director of Discipleship here at Columbia Presbyterian Church. Uh, we are going to continue on in our reading through the Gospel of Luke as David is preaching through the book of Acts. Today I will be reading from Luke chapter 3, verses 15 through 22. Hear the word of the Lord. As the people were in expectation... And all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Christ. John answered them all, saying, I baptize you with water, but he who is mightier than I is coming, the strap of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. So, with many other exhortations, he preached good news to the people. But Herod the Tetrarch, who had been reproved by him for Herodias, his brother's wife, and for all the evil things that Herod had done, added this to them all, that he locked up John in prison. Now, when all the people were baptized, and when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, the heavens were opened, and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, with you I am well pleased. That is God's word to us. Would you stand with me as we respond with singing? Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And please be seated. Isaiah chapter 44, verses 15 through 17 say this. Then a piece of wood becomes fuel for a man. He takes a part of it and warms himself. He kindles a fire and bakes bread. Also, he makes a god and worships it. He makes it an idol and falls down before it. Half of it he burns in the fire, over the half he eats meat. He roasts it and is satisfied. Also, he warms himself and says, Aha, I am warm, I have seen the fire. And the rest of it he makes into a god, his idol, and falls down to it and worships it. He prays to it and says, Deliver me, for you are my god. Now this week, I'm sure not many of us have cut a stick in half and then roasted half of it for, to make our food, and then we carved an image into it and then bowed down and worshiped it and said, you are my God, give me deliverance. But we have done that in our hearts this week. We have had these idols come forth in our hearts that replace Jesus, those, those idols that say, if I just had this, it would deliver me, or if I just did that, it would satisfy me, or if I was able to show other people this, I would be validated in who I was. I'm going to ask this church to take a moment to pray silently, to ask the Lord to show you where in your life you have made an idol, where you have tried to replace the living God with something as menial as a stick that you carve a face onto. Let's take a moment to pray and ask the Lord to show us our hearts. Lord Jesus, I was able to have the same time of silent confession in first service, and even now, Lord, you you show me continued idols of my heart. 
things that I want to replace you with, things that I feel like will deliver me, promises that I cling to that will rust and wither and, and moth will destroy and they will be molded and burned away. Lord, you had one of your saints say that our hearts are like little idol factories that we're constantly producing and overproducing things that want to take your place. And I would ask, Lord Jesus, that you give us hearts to see that there is nothing that we can cling to that is not as good as you. You are the very deliverance, the very salvation, the very God of the universe who has called us and saved us that will bring us all the way to heaven and to glory and to joy eternal in you and nothing else can do that. Lord, let us remember throughout this week, let us be quick to confess. Let us be quick to repent and turn from our idols and turn back to you and that we would be able to proclaim and remember the assurance of our forgiveness in you, Jesus. We pray these things in your name, amen. Church, I would ask you to recite with me from Acts 4.12 our assurance of forgiveness. We will speak this in unison as we remember and you hear the voices of your brothers and sisters around you that we have an assurance of our forgiveness. So read with me. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Amen. Would you stand and let's sing together.
That was amazing. Church, we're going to continue on our worship with our profession of faith. Uh, this should not be a surprise. It's the Heidelberg Catechism again. And so I'm going to ask this question, and I would ask for you to respond in unison with me. And let these words not just come out of your heart or your mouth, but let them sink into your heart so you can remember your true identity. What is your only comfort in life and death? That I am not my own but belong with body and soul, both in life and in death, to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. He has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood and has set me free from all the power of the devil. He also preserves me in such a way that without the will of my heavenly Father, not a hair can fall from my head. Indeed, all things must work together for my salvation." 
Therefore, by his Holy Spirit, he also assures me of eternal life and makes me heartily willing and ready from now on to live for him. Amen. Please have a seat. We're going to continue our worship as we give of our finances. Uh, And as you're giving of your finance, I pray that you also would consider how can you give of your time and your talents and your abilities and your house that we would all continue to work together to advance the kingdom of God in Columbia. Also, I would encourage you to turn to Acts chapter 4 and prepare your hearts for the sermon. Guys, friends, we are indeed in Acts chapter 4. I'm going to read beginning in verse 1. Hear now God's word. And as they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to about 5,000. On the next day, their rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with Annas the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and all who were of the high priestly family. And when they had set them in their midst, they inquired, by what power or by what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. And when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated common men, they were astonished and they recognized that they had been with Jesus. Let's pray together. Peter and John had been with Jesus. We have been with Jesus. Let that be the truest, dearest, most wonderful thing about us. These are hard truths. The gospel is a hard truth. Let us strip away all the things that are not in the Bible that offend our culture, our position, our posture, our attitude. And let us hold fast to the things in the Bible, even if they offend. That Jesus alone is the only way of salvation. We need courage for that, Lord. And I pray you would give it to us in Jesus' name. Friends, there are few more scandalous doctrines in the Bible than the exclusivity of Jesus. To dare tell a watching world that the only possible way for a person to have a living, 
breathing, saving relationship with the triune God is through his son Jesus. Repentance and faith in his son Jesus in this life, that is absolutely offensive today. That's offensive to our culture. Our culture has taken the opposite paradoxical stance that anyone is welcome to believe anything as long as no one believes anything that is relevant to everyone. Did you guys catch that? That's like really important because if you mistweet that, you will be canceled forever. So let me run it by you again. Anyone is welcome to believe anything as long as no one believes anything that is relevant to anyone. Everyone. I think I got it. Okay? There is one absolute in our culture today, and that is that there are no absolutes. There is one way of salvation in our culture today, and that is that everybody's way of salvation is valid. There is one definition of love, and that is that I will choose myself how and when and where and what love looks like. The moment you say in 21st century American culture, that is wrong, this is right, that is false, this is true, you have committed the unforgivable sin. It was great to see you online, we'll never see you again. You will be buried. You can't say that today. You can't say that in our culture. And so it's wild to pick up this account of Peter and John in the temple saying things in the Holy Spirit that we just don't feel like we can say anymore. This is wild. And so I want to walk through this account and understand exactly what the apostle is saying to us. Now, this is all part of the same story that we've been in the last couple of weeks. It's a long story. It's a wild story. There's twists and turns. Peter and John, they were on their way to the temple. They saw the man who was born lame, and by God's power, they healed him, and that man went dancing into the temple. People were amazed by the miracle, and so Peter begins to preach to the crowd. And really, up until that point, there's nothing wrong with what these guys have done. I mean, they're more than welcome to be in the temple at 3 p.m. to pray. And it's amazing that God gave them power to heal somebody and there was a miracle done. And and it's okay for them to open the Bible and to preach. That would have been expected in the temple in that day. But then the religious leaders hear something that pricked their ears and all of a sudden made something that was not a big deal a really, really big deal. And that happens in verse 2. They were greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. They would have been totally fine, totally absolved, totally celebrated if they had resisted using that one pesky name of Jesus in the sermon that they were preaching. Had they not done that, they would be celebrated right now. They just performed a miracle, and the crowds loved them and flocked to them. The religious leaders, they would be vying for their attention, getting next to their influence. Publishers, they'd be all over Peter, ready for his memoirs to hit book stands. They would be celebrated if they had just kept quiet about that one name. I mean, people build entire careers on nothing but being thought well of in religious circles and distancing themselves as much as possible from the Jesus of the Bible. You can do that, and you can be celebrated today, and you could have been celebrated in Peter and John's day, but at the name of Jesus, and I mean utter allegiance and service to that precious name, it will set these men on a course, a harrowing course, away from fame and popularity, on towards what will ultimately be exile and martyrdom, respectively. Count the costs of naming Jesus. Friend, count the cost of naming Jesus. 
Now, Peter and John, they get arrested for this, and they're thrown in jail. They spend a night there. And when they wake up, a a whole council has gathered together, the religious leaders, and you wonder if by the sheer size of it, it's really meant to intimidate them, to get them to be quiet. You've got the rulers and the elders, scribes, high priestly family, the Sadducees, the temple guards, and, and they hold a trial. And it's fascinating the way they ask Peter about what's going on because they kind of tiptoe around what's happening here. It's like they can't even bring themselves to say the name Jesus. And so they ask him in verse 7, by what power or by what name did you do this? Like, is there a name that you're using? And what's this thing that you have done? It's kind of like Harry Potter the name that shall not be named, even when they're pressing him, they can't even say who it was and what happened. But no matter, Peter doesn't mind filling in blanks for other people, even when he's wrong. But he says the name that we're using, it's Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And the thing that was done, that was a man who was born lame, who has been healed. And that becomes the springboard for Peter then to evangelize this group of people who have gathered to tell him to stop evangelizing. And it culminates in this incredible verse. Acts chapter 4, verse 12, take it home and memorize it. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. That's a beautiful verse, and that's a hard verse to believe. When we say that the gospel is exclusive, we mean that there is no salvation outside of God's plan for salvation. Repentance and faith in his son Jesus for the forgiveness of sins and communion with God. You don't have that and there is no salvation apart from that. So at the very least when we say the gospel is exclusive, it means we are ruling out heresy And it means we're ruling out religiosity. We're ruling out heresy and we're ruling out religiosity. Now we'll start with heresy. And I hate to do this early on a Sunday morning before you had your second cup of coffee. But I need to hit you with three heresies that I am sure are well-meaning. But they are completely unbiblical. And if you believe them, they will rot a church from the inside out. So I'm going to give you these three. You don't have to remember their name. You have to remember the theme behind them. But the first heresy is pluralism. And that believes that all religious roads lead to God. So no matter what religion you're in, if you're faithful in that religion, it's just a different path to get to the same God. That's pluralism. All religious roads lead to God. The second one is inclusivism which says that Jesus dies on the cross for all people and saves all people, even if they don't in this life repent and trust in him. They don't know they're born again, but they are born again because Jesus saves all. Similar to that is universalism, which says that all people will eventually be saved. If you reject God in this life, the moment you experience eternal torment in hell, you recognize what you've done, you repent and believe in hell, and you will be restored to communion with God, you will be saved. Pluralism, inclusivism, universalism, you don't have to pass a pop quiz on these, you don't even have to remember their names, you just have to spot the thing that is common to all of them, which flies in the face of everything we have said from the book of Acts so far, And that is conscious repentance of sin and faith in Jesus is necessary for salvation. The Bible holds that. These heresies reject that. Like you can be a very devout Buddhist and you will be saved. Or you might reject Jesus in this life and taste judgment and then convert and you will be saved. Or you might never acknowledge Jesus in this life and realize that 
unbeknownst to you, he has converted you and you will be saved. Every person will experience God's salvation. But the Bible plainly teaches what Peter stresses here, that these are lies from the pit of hell itself. And that Satan delights for people to believe them, assume them, and be assured of safety in rejecting and resisting Jesus himself. There is no salvation outside of Jesus. That's true of heresy. That's also true of any kind of religiosity. So notice once again that Peter, when he's preaching this sermon, he's not preaching to pagans. He's not preaching to people who are running around doing these crazy offensive sins. He's within the temple preaching to religious people and not even run-of-the-mill religious people. He's actually preaching to the upper echelon. He's talking to the religious leaders. I mean, these guys got religion. They're in the temple for daily prayers. They're monotheists. They read their Bible. They do good things like give alms to a man born lame. They are decent people. And yet we are hearing that you can put your best decent foot forward with all the trappings of religion and still not embrace a saving knowledge of of Jesus. Alarmingly, here in the Bible Belt, that wears its religion like an ill fitted coat, is possible to bring our perfect church attendance straight to hell. Religion will not save us, the Christian religion without Jesus will not save us. Decency will not save us. The Bible says what Peter plainly stresses here. There is no other name. There's no other way. There's no other means of salvation except conscious repentance of sin and trust in Jesus. That is the only way. Now we need to think hard about this scene for a moment. Because if we're resisting, is this true? And does the Bible say this? And did Peter really believe this? We've got to come to account with the fact that if the Bible taught all religions led to God, or the Bible taught that decency and religiosity led to God, how do we explain Peter and what he's doing right now? He's standing in front of religious leaders who don't want him to evangelize. He's resisting the authority of his day. We must obey God rather than men. And he is preaching the gospel to people who are threatening him to stop preaching the gospel. And this will not go well for Peter. Now, he's lucky this first time in chapter 4 because according to Jewish law, if you didn't have rabbinic teaching, if you hadn't been through a school like Paul had, then the first thing you do to a false teacher is you arrest them and you charge them, you warn them, and then you let them go. And that happens to Peter. He has no schooling. They just chalk it up as a warning and he goes on his way. Peter doesn't stop. He comes back again And again and again, and at the risk of his own neck, he preaches the gospel until he is arrested and faces one of the most gruesome deaths of all. He will be crucified upside down. How do you make sense of that? A man who says that he saw Jesus alive and that he saw Jesus dead and that he saw Jesus alive again, And that he would preach this gospel of utmost danger to himself, to a world that told him to be quiet, but he would not be quiet. And it wasn't for fame and for wealth and for prestige and power. The thing he earned in this life for that truth was a gruesome death. Peter rejects pluralism, inclusivism, universalism, religiosity, 
and he put his neck on the line for the exclusivity of the gospel. That's a hard, hard truth. And it's not an easy thing to talk about, especially the way we often frame it in the negative. We often ask the question, is it really fair that God would send anyone to hell who doesn't find this narrow way of salvation? Like, what kind of God would do that if we're all out here looking and none of us finds it, and then those who didn't find it and reject him are eternally separated from him? That's a heavy truth that we don't talk about lightly, and it touches every single person in this room. You hear the emotion behind it, but then you also hear the presumption of humanity's innocence, right? Like the only way you are asking that question is because you're kind of setting up human beings as being innocent and eager to look for God and to find God. Like we're ready to do his will. We're ready to believe what he has to say. And it's only by chance that we missed what he was saying and we never heard it. We would have believed in it, but now we're rejected and we're separated from him forever. That's the way that kind of question is being framed. And yet, according to Scripture, that couldn't be further from the truth. As a humanity, we hate God. We resist God. We rebel from God. Even the things Romans 1 and 2 says that are plain about God because he made the world and everyone in them, even the things that should be evident to us about him and about his creation, we have rejected even those things to resist him. Even religions, other religions that we sometimes talk about as our best effort to find the one true God, Romans 1 and 2 says, no, that's our best effort to run from God and resist what he has told us about himself. We hate God and we don't want him. And we are so rabidly bent on crowning ourselves as little kings and little queens for our name, our glory, our prestige, our selfishness, service to us. It is a wonder that there is any means at all of salvation for those of us who are on a downward sprint away from God to hell itself to be free from it. What kind of God would intervene? What kind of a God would claim that kind of people for himself? The question is not, is it really fair for God to send some people to hell who don't find Jesus like a needle in a haystack? The question is, what kind of love and mercy and kindness is in store from a God for a person who has rejected him? to draw that person to himself? Why is there any means at all of salvation for humanity? But friend, I tell you from this passage, as sure as the sun rose this morning, as sure as there is ground beneath our feet, there is a name under heaven given to us by which we must be saved. It's the name that is above every other name. It's the name that on the last day, every knee will bow, every tongue confess. We can do that willingly now or in resistance then. It is a name that is a balm to the sick and it is aid to the weak. It is living water. It is daily bread. It is wine raised to the remission of sins. And if you hear this name, if God unplugs our ears and we can hear this precious name do not harden your hearts but receive it Jesus Christ of Nazareth I tell you the scriptures prophesied that he was coming that he came lived died rose from the dead, ascended into heaven, is it seated at the right hand of God the Father that any of us who are in a full sprint away from God, if our eyes are opened and we turn to him, might repent of our sins, trust in him, and receive a salvation we never deserved in the first place. Blessed be the name of the Lord. 
Blessed be the name of the Lord. Now, Peter is using this for evangelism, right? He's full on with the council preaching to people who reject God. And he is using it for evangelism. And his message is salvation is in Jesus alone. But that message is also good news for the believer who is born again. I'll know that many of us here this morning have trusted in Christ. We're born again. And the gospel is as good news to us today as it was when we first believed there is salvation in Jesus alone. Because we actually do something that's really confusing in our Christian life. We change the game of the gospel on ourselves. So we get into God's kingdom one way, repentance and faith. And then when we're in God's kingdom, a lot of us can't resist doing something else to stay in God's kingdom. Like it was his mercy and grace that brought us here. But surely he's expecting something from us to keep us here. And so we change the game. What was receiving a gift by faith has now become working to earn and to keep. And we're doing exactly what the church in Galatia did. When Paul said to them, having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Galatians 3, 3. We started one way. Why are you doing something else? But if we do anything else to assure our salvation, we betray that we believe there is another name under heaven. What do we do as believers? How do we we practically resist this name and claim another name when it comes to our salvation? I'm so glad you asked. I'll give us three of the most common ones that I do, that I hear you do in our conversations together. The first one we do, of course, is obedience. When I am in God's kingdom, my stature in the kingdom rises and falls on my obedience. If I feel like it's a good week, if I did my quiet time four days out of seven and I didn't yell at anybody, man, I belong here. And I feel welcome in this place. But it's those weeks I fall again and again and again in the same besetting sin that all of a sudden I'm not so sure that I belong here and God wants me here. And when I think that on a good week, and when I think that on a bad week, I betray that there is another name under heaven, and it's my name. It's what I do in my obedience. Obedience is a false gospel. A second one is my faith, and really by that I mean the size of my faith. I don't know if you've experienced this, but some days I wake up and I have zero doubts about the gospel. I am so assured that every word of this is true, that God is as present as oxygen. I get in this pulpit, I'm ready to preach because I believe this stuff, and I, I know myself to be in the kingdom. But what about those days that I don't feel that? And I wake up and... Doubt becomes this millstone around my neck. And I'm not so sure this is true. And I'm not so sure this is real. And I'm not so sure I should be in this pulpit saying these things until I'm fully convinced. And when I have those feelings, I betray that there's another name under heaven. And it's my name. And it's my faith that keeps me in the kingdom. We do that with obedience. We do that with Faith and the size of our faith, we do that with our feelings. Some mornings we wake up and we feel saved. I mean, we just feel loved. I mean, we just feel near to God. It's this giddiness. It's indescribable. You read it in the Psalms. God is like water in the desert and we love it. And we just feel mushy inside for our salvation. And then there's plenty of days. There are no warm and fuzzies. And it's hard. And we feel lost. And we feel unlovable. And we feel like God's not even listening to us when we pray. And when we feel those things, we betray another name. My name. My obedience. My righteousness. My faith in the size of my faith. My feelings. That is what secures me in God's kingdom. And none of that is true. Beloved, I have some terrifying news for you. You cannot save yourself. 
You cannot even keep yourself in God's kingdom. And beloved, I have some precious, glorious news for you. You cannot save yourself, and you cannot keep yourself in God's kingdom. The same work that saves us is the same work that keeps us. It is this name that is above every name, the name of Jesus. It is His righteousness, His resurrection, His life, His intercession that keeps us and holds us in God's kingdom assured of our salvation. That's the good news for the believer today in the gospel. Now I want to end with uh, my favorite verse after verse 12, which is really like a backhanded compliment to the apostles in verse 13. This is the council trying to make sense of Peter and John. They say in verse 13, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, that's awesome, and perceived that they were uneducated common men. How would you like that for a description? They were astonished, and they recognized that they had been with Jesus. That feeling that the council is having about Peter and John, I would love for the devil, the father of lies, to have about us. When he saw them, he realized that they were common, uneducated people. Like, they're not the sharpest tools in the shed in this room today, and there's nothing spectacular about them, and they look like easy prey, except then he realized there was something marvelous about them. They had been with Jesus. And all of a sudden, this group of saints was untouchable in God's kingdom. We resist the devil, and he flees from us. There is no other name under heaven given to us by which we must be saved. Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Let's pray together. Jesus, it is your name that we appeal to for salvation. It's your name we appeal to for assurance of that salvation. And it's your name we appeal to now to equip us to be vibrant, living, joyful, loving, selfless members of the kingdom that you've created. Give us this stalwart allegiance to your name that is above every name, we pray. In that name, Jesus' name, amen. Friends, let's stand and respond in singing.
Friends, so beautiful to worship together. If you're new here, please come and introduce yourself. After the benediction, we're going to hang out either in here or outside there because in the welcome area, we're going to set the tables up for the kids' communicants class. Hear now this benediction, which is horrifying news for a person resisting God and doing this their own way and could not be sweeter news for a believer in Christ or for someone here this morning who is about to be a believer in Christ because it comes from the mouth of Jesus himself. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Amen.